Thank you for tuning in to Math Science History. Before I begin talking about Italy's diabolical world of Renaissance mathematics, I want to ask if you're enjoying the show, please comment down below. Also, remember to like, subscribe, and hit that bell so that you get notifications every single time I upload a video. My first part was on Pacioli, the second part on Tartaglia, and now we're on with the show. When I last signed off, it was 1535, and Tartaglia had won the Tartaglia Fiore mathematical duel. Tartaglia was a rock star in the mathematical scene. He had solved all of Fiore's problems and was also able to find a solution for the cubic equation x cubed equals ax plus b. However, before I begin my story, I want to backtrack to the late 15th century, around 1482, when a man named Bartolomeo Ferrari had two sons, Vincent and Alexander. Alexander had two children, a daughter named Madalina and a son named Lodovico, who was born around 1522. Like Tartaglia, Lodovico and Madalina became orphaned when their father was killed. As a result, Lodovico was raised by his uncle Vincent and grew up with his cousin Luca. Luca was a troublemaker and was written into history as a difficult young man. Luca likely felt equally challenged by his father, so he ran away from home. Luca thus found himself in Milan looking for work, and eventually he landed a position working as a servant for the 35-year-old mathematician Girolamo Cardano. Cardano was an intelligent mathematician with a hot temper. He was born an illegitimate child in 1501 in Pavia. At that time, Pavia was in the Duchy of Milan, which means it was French territory. And I mentioned this in my last show about Tartaglia, where I talk about the war in the northern part of Italy when France's King Louis XII was the Duke of Milan. Girolamo's father was Fazio Cardano, a lawyer in Milan. He was also a brilliant mathematician too. Fazio taught geometry at the University of Pavia and at the Piatti Foundation in Milan. Fazio was so knowledgeable about geometry that Leonardo da Vinci had reached out to him for explanations on proportions and geometry. Possibly this was when he and Pacioli were working on Pacioli's book De Davina Proporzione. So, clearly, the mathematical community in Italy was small, and everybody knew everybody, because now we've come full circle with 36 years of association. Kind of cool. So when Fazio was 50 years old, he met Chiara Michiera, a single parent raising three children. Chiara had Girolamo out of wedlock, even though eventually Fazio and Chiara married. Sadly, Chiara's three other children died when the plague took over Milan. Girolamo learned mathematics from his father and found interest in academia, specifically medicine. He attended Pavia University where he did well. However, he also often argued with his peers and superiors. Not good. Girolamo wrote, quote, This I recognize as unique and outstanding amongst my faults, the habit which I persist in of preferring to say all the things what I know to be displeasing to the ears of my hearers. I'm aware of this, yet I keep it up willfully and in no way ignorant of how many enemies it makes for me. I guess he liked to make enemies. Girolamo spent his father's money and needed to earn more money. As a result, he began to gamble by playing card games, dice, and even chess. Even though he earned his doctorate in medicine in 1525, his gambling addiction tainted his reputation. So. Shortly after his father's death, Cardano needed to make money. So he moved about 10 miles away to a tiny village area now known as Piove di Sacco. He traveled back to Milan to apply to the College of Physicians. However, the college rejected him because of his gambling addiction and his abrasive reputation. It followed him wherever he went. However, the college needed a reason to deny him the entrance into the program, so they used his illegitimacy as a child. Moving back to PUV di Sacco, he ran a small medical practice, and in 1532, he married Lucia Bandarini. He and Lucia had three children. Unfortunately, his small practice 
didn't earn him enough money, so he and his wife moved 290 kilometers west to Gallarate, intending to make more money. However, he fell into deeper debt. He writes, quote, I ceased to be poor because I had nothing left, unquote. Makes sense. Luckily, through patrons and private funding, he could teach mathematics publicly, so that worked out. In 1535, he began to author his book, Practica Arithmetica Generalis, also known as the practice of arithmetic and simple mensuration. As a side note, this is the same year that Tartaglia beat Fiore in the math competition that I talked about in my last show. While working on his book, Cardano encountered an equation that he couldn't solve. It was the same cubic equation that Pacioli stated could have no general solution. And Cardano was unsuccessful. Also in 1535, he hired the young Luca Ferrari to be his servant. As noted before, Luca was a problematic kid. Luca didn't like working and possibly realized that he could live for free at home if he just tried to get along with his father. So, shortly after he arrived in Milan, Luca ran away from Cardano and returned to Bologna. Cardano was angry because Luca left Cardano before completing his employment. So, feeling slighted, Cardano reached out to Vincent Ferrari and demanded that he send Luca back to finish his employment. However, Vincent decided that instead of just sending his son back, he would also send his nephew Lodovico. Cardano wrote that on November 30th, 1536, a magpie in his courtyard, quote, kept up such an endless and altogether unwanted chattering that we were looking for someone to arrive, unquote. This day was when 14-year-old Lodovico Ferrari and his cousin Luca arrived on Cardano's doorstep. Luca was to complete his employment as a servant, and Lodovico was to begin his work as a servant. However, Cardano learned that Lodovico was educated and could read and write. As a result, Cardano appointed Lodovico as his secretary. While working as his secretary, Cardano realized that Lodovico was brilliant, and so he began to teach him mathematics. Lodovico eventually became one of his three most outstanding students, thereby entertaining Cardano to question if the magpie's Turing was a sign. In 1537, Cardano applied to the College of Physicians in Milan for a second time, and again, the college rejected him. Meanwhile, he continued to work on his book and attempted to solve several cubic equations. He was still unsuccessful. By 1539, many individuals had withdrawn their objections toward Cardano at the College of Physicians in Milan. Furthermore, two of his friends provided glowing referrals for Cardano to teach medicine at the same college. As a result, the college finally hired him to teach. Though Cardano still had a reputation for being abrasive, he found success teaching medicine and writing. Additionally, his lessons with Ferrari proved to be beneficial. Ferrari helped Cardano with his manuscripts and became quite a mathematician in his own right. They had a successful working relationship, although both had hot tempers. Furthermore, Ferrari was known for having a stormy temper, so much that even Cardano would avoid him at times. At one point, three years into their working relationship, Ferrari had come back from a fight missing some fingers on his right hand. It's kind of gross. So, meanwhile, back in Milan, Cardano had an interesting encounter with a character from my last show, Zuan Decoy. Decoy was the individual who gave Tartaglia two cubic equations and sparked Tartaglia's interest in solving these equations. Decoy had moved to Milan and met Cardano, who was still struggling to solve certain cubic equations. So, Cardano had published Practica and began working on his next book, Ars Magna. Upon telling Decoy about his challenges with his cubic equations, Decoy told Cardano about Tartaglia's solutions. So, taking this tip from Decoy, he sent the publisher, Zuan de Bassano, to Tartaglia with seven cubic equations asking for the solutions and the formula to solve them. 
the Gaul. It was Cardano's goal to publish them in his book Ars Magna. Thus, da Bassano arrived with seven equations and stated that if he didn't want to impart the solutions to Cardano, at least give Cardano the 30 equations that he solved in the Tartaglia Fiore duel along with the solutions. Offended at this request, Tartaglia refused his offer and told Zuan to tell His Excellency that he must pardon me, that when I publish my invention, it will be in my own work and not of others. Tartaglia informed Dabasano that Cardano could obtain the questions from the court and that he would not share the solution. Good for him. Then, after observing the seven equations that Dabasano brought from Cardano, Tartaglia had a revelation. He replied to Dabasano again, stating, These questions are from Messer Zuan de Coy and from no one else for I recognized the last two. Two years ago, he proposed to me a question like the sixth, and I made him own up that he neither understood the problem nor knew the solution. He also proposed one similar one to the last one, which involves working in census and cubes equal to a number, and out of my kindness, I gave him the solution less than a year ago. For such solutions, I found a particular rule applicable to similar problems." Unquote. That's what he said. In this letter, Tartaglia pointed out Cardano's lack of originality and used Tartaglia's initial formula he shared with Decoy two years prior. He knew he was up to something. Well, Cardano was furious. He replied on February 12, 1539, and accused Tartaglia of being greedy and uncharitable and being a fraud. Cardano then attempted to coax Tartaglia to solve two of the equations he sent. Cardano's ulterior motives were evident, and Tartaglia was aware of this. Regardless, on February 18th, Tartaglia replied, he shouldn't have. To the first equation, he gave an elegant solution in poetry. However, the second, he did not provide a solution. Now that Cardano had a clue how to solve these cubic equations, Cardano put Ferrari to work to try and solve the cubic equations to discover how Tartaglia solved them. Then, on March 13, 1539, Cardano sent a letter to Tartaglia, only this time his letter was filled with flattery and praise. He begins his letter stating, Messer Nicolo, mio carissimo. In Italian, mio carissimo translates to my dearest. He tells Tartaglia not to be offended by his former words. He blames his insults on Decoy, who had left him a wrong impression of Tartaglia. He tells him that Decoy left the university unceremoniously and left behind 60 pupils that needed a professor. He continues his flattery by inviting Tartaglia to visit him, telling him that the Marchese del Vasto, the Spanish governor of Lombardy, wanted to meet him. Tartaglia questioned the validity of this invitation and wrote to a friend that if he didn't go to Milan, the Marquis might take offense. As a result, his absence might not look good for him, so Tartaglia went unwillingly. So, on March 25, 1539, Tartaglia arrived at Cardano's house. However, Tartaglia arrived only to discover that the Marchese del Vasto was not there. Tartaglia noted the conversation and published the dialogue in his book, Quasiti et Invenzioni Diverse. He writes that Cardano began by saying, quote, It is convenient for us that the Marquis has just left for Vigivano so we can talk about our affairs until he returns. You surely have not been any too obliging in not showing me the solutions of the cube in Cosse equal to a number that I have so earnestly asked you to do. Is that me or is Cardano a snake? Unbelievable. So, anyhow, Tartaglia told him that if he gave away the solution, Cardano would probably publish them as his own and completely spoil Tartaglia's upcoming book. He then goes on to accuse Cardano of potential plagiarism. But Cardano pressed on. He promised he would keep the solutions a secret, telling Tartaglia, quote, I swear you by the holy evangels of God and as a true man of honor that I will not only never publish it, but I will write it for myself in code so that no one finding them after my death can understand. If you will now believe me, believe. If not, let it pass. 
Tartaglia cave and gave him the solution for the two equations. The equations that he gave and the solutions that he gave were for x cubed plus ax equals b and x cubed plus b equals ax. This was very valuable information at this time. However, he gave him the solution in 25 lines of poetry. Though Tartaglia made the solution difficult for Cardano, Cardano put Ferrari to work to try and solve the cubic equations for his book Ars Magna. On some level, Tartaglia's poem did thwart Cardano. Even though Cardano had Ferrari to help him solve these equations, he still wrote to Tartaglia on April 9 because he had trouble with his mathematical poetry. Tartaglia replied, correcting his misunderstandings, big mistake, and giving him another hint about the solution. Nevertheless, Tartaglia was still uncomfortable giving him this information. Over the following months, Cardano wrote several letters to Tartaglia, but Tartaglia never responded because he was busy working on his translations of Euclid. Finally, still working on his book Ars Magna, Cardano wrote to Tartaglia on August 4th, 1539, quote, I have certainly grasped this rule. Tartaglia, after reading this, realized that Cardano was close to figuring it out. Also, he had received a rumor that Cardano prepared to publish Tartaglia's solutions, claiming these new rules in algebra as his own. In a letter to Cardano, Tartaglia corrected him with false information, thereby hoping to confuse him and thwart his project Ars Magna. Additionally, he called out Cardano on his plagiarism. Tartaglia told him that he knew of his plans to publish his secret solutions to the cubic equations. The dispute became so heated that Ferrari decided to inject himself into the argument. The reason is that he had been solving these equations for Cardano. Thus, Ferrari wrote back to Tartaglia, defending Cardano, stating, quote, you have the infamy to say that Cardano is ignorant in mathematics, and you call him uncultured and simple-minded, a man of low standing and coarse stock, and other similar offending words too tedious to repeat? This matter concerns me personally, since I am his creature. I have taken it upon myself to make known publicly your deceit and malice, unquote. <laughs> That's... <laughs> Sorry, that's hysterical. Taking the solution that Tartaglia used to solve x cubed plus ax equals b, Cardano and Ferrari found solutions for x cubed plus ax squared equals b and x cubed equals ax squared plus b and x cubed plus b equals ax squared. This was quite a huge leap in algebra at this time. These solutions created a distinct gap in any opportunity for cordial discussion about these cubic equations. Tartaglia was furious, and rightly so. However, Tartaglia was not Cardano's only victim. In 1541, Cardano resigned from the Piatti Foundation. He intended to have Ferrari take over his position. However, Decoy wanted the position, so a duel was arranged between Ferrari and Decoy. Having studied all of Decoy's earlier problems, Ferrari understood how much Decoy knew about cubic equations. As a result, Ferrari won the duel and the public lecture position at the Piatti Foundation. Ferrari was only 20 years old. Cardano and Ferrari continued to work together on the cubic equations. In 1545, Cardano published his book Ars Magna and all the answers to the cubic equations contained in Tartaglia's solutions. Tartaglia was furious and made it officially known in his book, Quasiti et Invenzioni Diverse, which he published in 1546. These published conversations infuriated Ferrari. So on February 10th, 1547, Ferrari challenged Tartaglia to a duel on geometry, arithmetic, astrology, music, cosmology, perspective, and architecture. Tartaglia ignored the request for a duel. However, in March 1548, Tartaglia was invited to Brescia to conduct public lectures and private lessons. 
However, his patrons would not give him this position unless he followed up on the duel with Ferrari. So, on August 10th, 1548, in Milan, Tartaglia and Ferrari conducted an intellectual duel. However, this competition was nothing like the Tartaglia-Fiore duel. It was a public presentation where both parties would debate against each other. Tartaglia knew more about cubic equations, however, Ferrari provided stellar arguments on other topics. As a result, Ferrari won and Tartaglia never obtained the position that he wanted in his hometown of Brescia. Instead, he moved to Venice where he would continue to seek work and teach publicly through the funding of patrons. He died nine years later in Venice. Ferrari was the new rock star of math in Italy. He took over Cardano's position at the Piotti Foundation, and after working at the foundation, Ferrari obtained employment working as a tax assessor. He then accepted the same role as a tax assessor for the church, which served him quite well. As a result, Ferrari became exceptionally rich and was able to retire as a young man. In his wealthy retirement, he moved back to his hometown of Bologna to take care of his widowed sister, Maddalena. While back home, Ferrari began a position as a professor of mathematics at the University of Bologna in 1565. Sadly, he died a year later. The reason? Well, he was poisoned. Why was he poisoned? Was it for the mathematical solutions? Did Tartaglia poison him because of his loss to Ferrari? Or was it the unemployed decoy who lost the position at the foundation because of Ferrari? Or was it Cardano who needed more money because he was losing a court battle because his own son murdered his daughter-in-law? Who murdered Ferrari? Well, actually, it was none of those people. It was Madalena, his sister, who poisoned Ferrari. She took his entire fortune upon his death and remarried two weeks later. Upon transferring all of her possessions over to her new husband, he left her. Madalena died in poverty. And such was the life of a mathematician in Renaissance Italy. Or, as one great Italian once said, That's life! And as funny as it may seem, some people get their kicks stomping on a dream but i don't let it let it get me down because this final world it keeps spinning around until next time carpe diem Thank you for tuning into Math Science History. If you're enjoying the show, please come on over to Patreon at patreon.com slash math science history. All my tiers are now at $1.39 because 139 is a happy number and you can pay what you want starting at that level if you like. And with that, you get our early releases of my videos, of my podcasts, and of my transcripts. I now have a store. If you want to visit me at mathsciencehistory.store, I've got t-shirts and drinking bottles and really cool yoga mats. Oh, oh, my podcast. That's what started this whole thing. If you want to check out my podcast, you can find me on any of your preferred podcast platforms. Just look for Math Science History with Gabrielle Burchak. And until next time, carpe diem.